to make more money, you know, in other words, you should learn how to do something. Okay. And if you want to make more money, you should learn how to manage people. Then you can make more money. And if you want to make a lot of money, you should learn how to manage money. <laughs> <laughs> so, What's your view on the change of the form of money to digital assets? Oh, that is such an interesting question. That is such an interesting question. What, what was the question? What was the question? What's change the, the change of form of money from fiat to digital assets? Like Bitcoin and yeah. blockchain. So I think money is so, the short answer is money is so important that we will not let the change happen. Okay? The governments, the so governments are in the business of controlling power. That's what a government is. And money is such a powerful commodity and it is so important to power that they will not let that happen. And that's why you will see a lot of regulation and a lot of control. That said, the genie is out of the bottle. Right? There is a blockchain out there, there is a Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto is sitting somewhere. You know Satoshi Nakamoto is the guy, you know, he's sitting somewhere, who knows, he, maybe she, I don't know, you know, nobody knows, he's sitting somewhere with a billion dollars of, of blockchain, you know, sitting somewhere. Uh, and so, I think they will coexist, they will be increasingly regulated. To some extent, people will try to co-opt them. So China is trying very hard to co-opt it. I think Canada is making some effort to co-opt. Canada is very smart. They've done some very good thinking around it. And they may succeed. You know, they may succeed. I think Venezuela uh, was an uh, incomplete experiment. Early adopter is going to die. You know, it's, uh, not, they didn't complete the process. They so they're going to die. Sorry? They went to the dollar. Well, dollar is fiat currency. In yeah, yeah, no, so it's a commodity tried. currency for Venezuela. Many and people try it yeah, in Venezuela. No. But Venezuela doesn't control the dollar. So for them, it's a commodity currency, right? It's like going to gold. For them, yeah. gold and dollar is almost the same thing. You know, I mean, the, the ec economic impact of it will be the same to them. It, basically, they're giving up control. You know, if you go to the dollar means they give up control. So the real question is, uh, you know, will we have commodity currencies like Bitcoin? Yes, it will be a hybrid. But also remember, the reason we went to fiat currency, there are there are bad reasons, but there are also good reasons why we went to fiat currency. And those reasons are that it lets us control the economy. Right now, as we speak, we are raising interest rates very, very quickly because we are trying to slow the economy down. We lose that control if you go to a, if you go to a digital currency. And so we don't want to give up that control. Okay? Before the Federal Reserve, we had a run on the banks every two to three years in America. After the Federal Reserve, while we were still on the gold standard, we had a recession every five to seven years in America. But we were on the gold standard. Now, you know, hopefully we are at an even better place where we don't have the gold standard and we have the Federal Reserve and, you know, they'll do their best. I mean, they'll get it wrong. You know, they're human beings. They have their limitations, but they are working. They're trying to make it happen. So we lose all that if we go to a digital currency. So you don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it up. You know, I want them to raise the interest rate when the economy overheats. I don't want to run on the back. Thank you. So, um, learn from your earliest operating background. Oh, that's a great question. The question is, how do you apply your operating background experience to, uh, to being an investor? And I think you also had that question from the Cayman Islands. Um, so here's my view of this. To be an investor is thinking holistically about the problem. You have to think about the person, the market, the money, everything has to come together and you think about the whole problem. And any experience you can bring to that is a net positive. You know, if I knew art, if I knew biology, if I knew physics, I'll bring all of that to make a decision and it'll help me make a decision. So anything you know is good. Having operating experience is good. Having operating experience also gives you domain knowledge. Right. That's incredibly valuable. Yeah. If you're investing in that domain. Yeah. By the way, the space you are in is of great interest to me. So maybe you and I should talk yes, offline. We should. We, should. Okay. we yes. should do that. Yeah. Okay. But whatever the domain, if you have that domain, it, it's it's of it's a benefit. However, when you are an operating executive, you learn to make decisions. Just like when you ride a bicycle, you learn to ride a bicycle. When you cook food, you learn how to cook food. And anybody who cooks food every day or rides a bicycle, they don't have to read the instructions. You know, they just do it because they've done it enough. Just like that as an operating executive, 
when you send an email, when you make a decision, you don't think, why did I make that decision? Why did I do it that way? You just do it. As an investor, you have to do that. But your instincts have to be very different. And you, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Paul had a fabulous example, which is that as an investor, we are mostly passive. We are depending on someone else to do the real work. We are actually living off their hard work. And our instinct as an operating executive is to fix the problem. As, especially as an engineer, you want to jump in and you want to fix the problem. As an investor, it may be better off not fixing the problem. For those of you who have children, it's like when you're dealing with children. You Sometimes you want the child to make a mistake and you want them to learn from their mistake. It's very hard as a parent because you want to save them from it. And you want to save the child and you don't want the child to get hurt. But you know what? Nobody learned a bicycle without falling down at least once. You've got to fall down if you're going to learn how to ride a bicycle. And so you have to make mistakes and you learn but you learn the wrong instincts. And so if you want to be an investor, you will have to detoxify your brain yeah, yeah. and learn to think like an investor. Yeah. And that is a, it's an active process. It's not passive, it doesn't happen by itself. You have to actively do it. Just like learning to ride a bicycle, learning how to dance, learning how to sing. Those are active things which you have to practice to make it better. So, I have a reading list which uh, I can uh, distribute if people are interested. Certainly, I'll send yes. it to you. Yes. yes. How to think like a VC. Yes. Mm. Okay. And I have a reading list because I teach that other class with, uh, with in a different class. I, I teach how to think like a VC. And so, uh, where I teach the market size and some of those other classes. And so, there, you know, I talk about how you have to change. And being passive is an incredibly important aspect of being an investor. We are passive people. We want to see where something will go without us fixing the problem. That's the best investment. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Uh, I was at the right place at the right time and how do you make the most of the opportunities? I don't know who asked me that this. Me you asked me Gabby. this question. From Paraguay. Yes, from Paraguay, yes. I love that. Because I asked this exact same question to the first person that I ever met who was from America. I was 10 years old and I was in India and this person was a distant, kind of like a relative. You know, in India, everybody's related to you. Like, I'm <laughs> or something, like seven generations away, but he was my relative. He was visiting and I met him and he used to live in America. So I thought he was an American. I mean, he was actually an Indian, but oh, yeah. for me, he was an American. Right? He had just come back from America. A very smart guy. He had finished his PhD at Berkeley and he was visiting and he was a very successful guy. He's passed away now. And, uh, you know, he met me, I was a young kid. The first time I was meeting somebody, we were just having, talking in Indian way. And he said, oh, he said, what do you like? He said, do you like math? What is five times six? I gave him the answer. I was a, you know, I was a little kid, you know. I gave him the answer. And he was like, oh, you're smart. You're, you'll do well, you know. You see opportunities, you jump at the opportunities, you'll do well. Okay, uncle, I will also do, everybody's uncle, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, okay, uncle, I will jump at the opportunity if I see it. So then I, so, so, but I said, then I said, but how do I know it's a, I should jump, how do I know it's an opportunity? And he looks at me and he said, keep jumping. Oh. That's the answer. What people forget is that Microsoft, which is obviously a very famous and successful company by Bill Gates, is not the first company that Bill Gates started. Most people think he was only 17 years old when he started Microsoft. It was the second company he started. He had failed at Trafo Data Inc., which is the first company that he started. And then he started Microsoft. You, there is a lot of failure involved in success and people gloss over that. Yeah. So you have to jump at those opportunities. You can't know it. It's not knowable. If it was knowable, it would be easy. It's not knowable. Nice. You know, the person who runs the 100 meter dash uh, in whatever, seven seconds, or I don't know what, what the world record is now, Hussein Bolt or something. He has run hundreds of miles before he ran those seven seconds. Yeah, true. And that is how everything in life is. Thank you. Keep jumping. Do we have to Keep jumping. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yes. so we're Thank at about you. 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Yes, I do have a call.